Hello. Hola. How was your walk? Wow, I am I am right on the freaking money today. And so is Ingrid, right on the money. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, lovely. Hi. What did I miss? <laughs> you didn't miss anything. Rachel came back from a beautiful walk and she just logged in and then she's like, I'm right on the money today. And I'm like, yeah. Right? Exactly. I was like, I'm right on the money today. It was one of those days that I've been trying to cram in too many, too many, I'll just, I'll use the word juicy, too many juicy things. Oh, juicy. Tell me more. I know I've got my my little like emergency, just because I I just love the taste of it sometimes too. Anyway. I feel you. Oh my goodness. I have had a similar experience today of just like, I feel like that's perpetually not my problem, but like my inclination is to try to cram a lot of things in two days. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. And with that being, well, that's not really what that being said, we didn't get to actually formally introduce you and we're already recording now, but that's just kind of how we roll. We're just kind of candidly doing stuff and hero, you can ask that question out is he, my mic okay? <laughs> I think it's okay. Yeah, talking to the expert there about microphones and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah. Without further ado, Hero, would you like to introduce our guest? Why are we both wearing gray? This is. I don't. I don't know. I just. This is what I slept in. So. I've got. I've got my gray sweater here too. I'm actually. <laughs> if I get cold, I'm gonna throw it on. So. Absolutely. We got the memo. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Well, first of all, hi, Ingi. Uh, this is the lovely Ingrid Nelson, who I have known since the beginning of my journey to adulthood, who was one of the few yoga teachers that really stood out to me. And we are not going to talk about yoga fully in this conversation, but that is how we met. And over the years, Ingrid has come into life in and out, like the incredible unicorn that she is in all the positive ways of looking at it. Ingrid is a very established professional voice actress and an actress in itself, model, um, performer, uh, creative being, I like to say, creator of many things and very passionate about making, in my opinion, people happy and people feel connected to who they are and has been through many things in her life that have been a pure example of resilience, bravery, vulnerability, courage, and just being an incredible human being as a whole. And I don't want to give much away, to be honest. I would love for Ingrid herself to share what she likes to share organically. And I know there are certain things, Ingrid, that you expressed to me and Rachel that you'd be willing to talk about and kind of certain things that are of interest to you that you can share. And from there being an open book in that kind of context. So I would love to turn it over to you right away, kind of just throw you into it and share whatever you wish to share. (laughs) <laughs> oh my goodness thank you so much I feel emotional just hearing those words from you Hero because everything that you said about me you know I feel the same way about you and Rachel you know yeah. like what you are doing I've and I've listened to your podcast like what you're doing is so valuable like I'm probably gonna just like putting it out there I'm gonna get emotional <laughs> during this conversation yes because listening to your episodes like People, you know, like in in the juiciness of it, people are, you know, they're secret sharing and truth telling and like opening their hearts in ways that I think we really need right now, you know? Thank you so much. That means so much to me. Thank you for saying that. That made made more than just my day. I that's it's funny, like when you start to do these kinds of things and you hear people are actually listening to what you're saying, you're like, really? It's it's not like it's almost like a surprise, like. Yes, I put it out there to the public, but you actually listen to it, <laughs> you know? So- well, and like you two are both so engaging. Like, I love your dynamic. Like, it's just so much fun. Like, you feel like you're part of the gang listening. And you then, like, absolutely are. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I just, I feel like during this time, you know, storytelling, we've recognized uh, is that much more valuable. And, you know, the, the collective experience that we crave storytelling, and we want to hear stories, and then people, you know, can share their vulnerability in a way that is, you know, feel safe and supported in this environment. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, my God, stop, you're gonna make me get all catched and 
<laughs> word. I know, I know. I'm and then I'm going to get all schmutzy. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to need a schmutz and a right the schmutz off their face. <laughs> It. I'm like, if we had, it's funny, we had a, um, a guest on not that long ago, um, Michael Lang- Landsberg, and Michael Landsberg is Jewish, and he's, he's like, it was like a father figure, because he's probably yeah. in his 60s. By the end of the episode, he was schooling us on Hebrew words and like totally like jabbing it into Hero about what he was saying wrong. <laughs> it was, so, it was great. Great. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Hebrew school. I missed yes. out. <laughs> oh my God, totally. It's never too late. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my God. So sorry, go ahead. Here. Oh no, I was listening. So Ingrid, you're in Vancouver, right? You live in the kind of in the West Side region, um, False Creek area. Um, how have things been? Um, I mean, just right now, how are you doing right now? What's going on? What have you been up to? Thank you. Well, yes, I am still in False Creek and in the very living room where you and I have had dance parties. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Yes. 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 You and I have like just jumped around in here. I remember like one time it was just, yeah, such a fond memory. Such a fond memory. Yeah. Um, And yeah, uh, so where I'm at, also in this living room, I have um, been teaching from home a lot. So Um, I teach for a voiceover school in Vancouver called On The Mic Training. Um, They have a post-secondary accredited full-time program. So yeah, they have like a voiceover, like it's not a university, but it's like a, you know, um, post-secondary full-time program. So uh, I'm one of the instructors for the animation modules uh, for that. Um, And tell us, and tell us why. I mean, people that don't know you, tell us why probably you were asked to do something like that. Right. Yes. So uh, I've been teaching for a number of years now, and I've been a professional in the world of voiceover for about 13 years now. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And it was always something that like while I was teaching yoga, I was doing in the background and like I didn't I don't know. It was just like what I always did. Uh, I started acting professionally uh, almost 20 years ago in film and TV, moved out to Vancouver from Saskatchewan where I grew up. And uh, found voiceover and um, became really intrigued in it that it was less about like appearances and hair and makeup and like, you know, all that film can potentially um, want to put you in a box about. Um, Right. Yeah. And so voiceover appealed to me. Um, I went to the agent for voiceover at my agency. She sent me for training. I went for training and then um, more training. uh, And as luck would have it for my first audition that she sent me on, uh, I booked the role and it was a series that ended up running for a long time. Strawberry shortcake. Um, Oh, (laughs) yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and that just kind of like started the ball rolling. And from there I've done um, many shows over the decade plus that I've been doing this. And um, I've just been so fortunate to, you know, make a career of it. Um, and then to be asked to serve as a teacher and, uh, and I'm so passionate about this work. And I love that, you know, in my career as a voiceover artist, I can be anything from like a princess to a penguin to like an elevator, you know, <laughs> that's hilarious. Oh my God. I love it. I feel like probably with the, with your scope of work that COVID maybe didn't have much of a damper on it just because maybe I'm wrong, but because, you know, you're typically, you're in a studio, you're, you're already kind of separated from somebody. It's not like you're having to work up close. Like you would, if you were acting on a set, which I know, you know, they kind of figured that out fairly quickly, actually, to be honest, in the beginning of COVID, but how has that kind of changed um, your work? Yeah. You know, it's been interesting because, um, at first, I think everyone kind of shut down and was like, what the heck is going on? And then, yeah, production did figure out pretty quickly how to continue to run sessions. Um, so, yeah, auditions that had been somewhat in person and you submit an MP3, like it had kind of been like sort of half and half are now entirely MP3 submission. So. Right. I have an MP3 audition to submit for a new show tomorrow. It's top secret, so I can't say <laughs> uh, what it's for. But um, but yeah, it's entirely like recorded on your own at this wow. point in time. 
And then for sessions, some of them um, you'll record from home, but that's only if you have like a completely professional sound booth and like source connect. So most of the time you'll go in one actor at a time uh, for a session into a studio. And so, yeah, it's, it works. The downside is that you don't have another actor to play off of. Right. It's, and so, like, as actors, we're also reactors, and like, you know, we're interacting. Um, yeah, so it definitely has its, you know, downsides being one actor at a time in the studio at the moment. But um, there is like an engineer in the next room, so you never like really come into contact with anyone. But like, they're there, and then the production is there, like either on Skype or like somehow like you know video calling in, so that they can see you and give direction. And yeah, so. <laughs> That's that is unbelievable. Amazing. So what I was wondering about is that with all the projects you've been working on and the adaptation with the pandemic and everything that's been going through, um, what are some of the ways that you've managed to take care of yourself through the process, whether if it's offline, if it's online? Um, and also, I know you have your incredible furry friend, Salsa, still with you, who I remember when you first got Salsa. She's the most adorable puppy. <laughs> she's actually sleeping right behind me so yeah so speaking of like cramming many things into a day we were at the vet right before this and uh so she's all sleeping now she just got some shots so she's yeah she's good to go um yeah <laughs> she's seven years old now oh my yeah God. Yeah. Yeah. So she uh, is a rescue from Mexico. And it was actually while I was teaching, co-teaching a yoga retreat in Puerto Vallarta that we volunteered at the SPCA there for a day. And I ended up leaving with salsa. So I remember um, that. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't planning to get a dog. And now here I am. So <laughs> amazing. Amazing. And so again, like animal therapy, especially during COVID, especially all the people that have been getting COVID pop puppies or making COVID babies, I like to joke about. But in terms of your self-care and things that really inspire you outside of your work as an actress, as a voice actress, as a creative, I don't know if you're teaching um, yoga even privately or in your own space anymore, but what are some of the things that you find has been really helpful for your self-care within a field that can be quite demanding and potentially quite draining, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, and the reality of teaching, you know, I just came off of teaching like three classes at a time and they're like three, four hour long classes. Um, and so I was doing that for like an extended length of time. And so, yeah, like taking care of myself, it has to be my priority. And, yeah. you know, the, and the last few years and, and this past year in particular has really highlighted that. And so um, my, taking care of myself comes first and there's lots of ways that I can do that. And, um, and, and yeah, I mean, salsa is, is a big part of that for sure. Uh, animal therapy and, you know, just having her there. She, is, she is like a, you know, she's like a family member. She's, she's like an emotional support animal to me. Um, and then, yeah, I, I mean, in terms of yoga, so <clears throat> I integrate like yoga and meditational principles into my voice classes. Um, yeah, I'm not actively teaching yoga at the moment, but I do meditate every day. And that I can like credit to um, really uh, providing a foundation for wellness and like on every level, like mental, physical, spiritual, you know, just wellness. It's what I do when I get out of bed first thing in the morning. And, you know, it, it hasn't taken over for my sadhana, like my, you know, physical asana practice, but um, it is like my, my daily routine that is like a non-negotiable, you know? Mm -hmm. and of course. Do you, cause I know you've got Tempest Jade as well, correct? And so is that must be, is that something else that's just a really like, it, it just it sound, it seems like an amazing outlet for you to just, you know, not just, it's just so cliche to say be you, but you know, but to, but to be you and to express yourself because you're doing all this expression, which is just right now predominantly voice, not so much everything else. But I feel like with maybe explain more about that. Cause how did you get into pole? And I mean, it's, I, it's just gorgeous to watch. So well, thank you so much. Yeah. So 
Um, well, this is like a whole backtrack um, moment, but uh, so I am adopted and uh, my name at birth was, is Tempest Jade. What? I, know. I didn't know that. Yeah. So that's like the origin story of it. And I actually don't know the origins of that story uh, per se, because um, I have yet to reunite with uh, with my birth family. It's certainly something that I'm interested in and have pursued. Um, and so, yeah, maybe one day I'll be able to uh, provide more information on that. So, mm. um so yeah, uh, Tem- Tempest State is kind of an alias uh, under which I make music. So uh, I released an EP uh, a couple of years ago in 2019. Um, and it was just kind of like a passion project. Like I'd always wanted to make and release music. Um, and so, yeah, it just, it came to a point where it was possible and uh, I was able to um, rent out the Rio and have a big artist showcase because I didn't want it to be like all about me. So I um, got some great local artists uh, that um, ha- create work that I'm inspired by and just had this like big evening of, you know, showcasing local talent. And that was kind of when my EP was released. And so, yeah, um, <laughs> it, yeah, it's kind yeah, of. Yeah, no, I didn't realize because I, I did actually notice and I listened to one of your songs on Spotify, which was like, was really kind of got me going today this morning. I forgot which one, what it was called, but I didn't realize that Tempest Jade was um, kind of grew from like, not just pole, but like a um, back an origin. origin, well, not just an origin, but music and entertainment and, and kind of yes. a whole picture ball rolled into one kind of thing. So, Yeah. Yeah, you know, like, I think, as a creative person, like I mentioned, like, there's so many avenues that interest me. And I think that, um, you know, uh, the voiceover world is is kind of like just one part of me. And then so um, the music aspect and uh, dancing and um, yeah, uh, it's just like, different forms of expression of like the same soul, you know, but I think that like, um, for me in creating music and, uh, and in teaching, uh, dance classes, um, I kind of, uh, yeah, can appreciate using that alias as like, it's another aspect of myself. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, with pool, um, I teach, uh, classes at a fitness studio in Vancouver called Tantra Fitness. Um, and so currently I'm offering an online hand balance class weekly. Um, and then, yeah, because they're shut down for group classes, um, they're the only place that I'm teaching like anything close to like yoga or fitness at the moment. And so when they do open up, uh, I was teaching like a fitness in heels class nice. um, and a pole class. And so, yeah, that's like another area of passion. I grew up a, a trained dancer, like ballet, jazz and tap and all of that. And so when I discovered pole for fitness a few years ago, it was really, um, yeah, just like an awakening within me of something that I feel had been, kind of repressed Mm -hmm. and and uh so um yeah discovering that whole environment gave me permission to like yeah explore another side of myself through dance through you know the fitness element of it and creativity and um I'm so grateful now that I have the opportunity to share that as a teacher absolutely it's really incredible as well because I was going to ask you about what was your first memory with movement in your body that made you connect to the kinesthetic realm of expression through the body through the soul through the spirit because I'm like was it earlier in childhood was it when you were still in Saskatchewan or was it when you moved to BC kind of what how did that all come about for you yeah um thank you for asking so it's funny uh my parents say that I was dancing before I ever walked. Yeah. <laughs> so like they would play like Paul Simon, like uh, the the old vinyls of like, you can call me Al, the Graceland album, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know it. Um, and yeah. And I just remember like being a kid and like dancing to these old records. And it was always just like a part of me, like essentially who I am. And so from as early as I could like talk, I was like, mom, I want to be in dance classes. Um, and so, yeah, I, I grew up doing, yeah, ballet, jazz, tap, all the classical forms of, of dance. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was really interested in like free expression. And so I think that um, 
when I moved out to Vancouver, which was partly to train at the Harper Dance Center. Okay. In addition mm-hmm. to working in film. Yeah. Um, that's when I found yoga. And I think like the the freedom of movement and like the therapeutic aspect of yoga um, spoke to that sensibility in me of like breaking away from like very rigid forms, although yoga can be rigid too. So anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, absolutely. And even in your teaching journey and stuff, I've been witness to see how you've evolved that and where it took you and how you shifted even not just what you taught, but how you taught and the things that you stood for. And it takes a lot of courage and a lot of independence to be able to be that kind of strong force of communication in our community. Because I mean, I myself have definitely been, and I don't say it in a negative way, but I've been a dark horse. I've been kind of our rainbow sheep in our community, you know, and Rachel knows that all too well. So it's really nice to see people that are carving a way for them to be successful in whatever they deem to be successful, but not following a mold or following some kind of cookie cutter that might, you know, deprive them of actually being who they truly are, right? Kind of being in an industry that's meant to be authentic and transparent and vulnerable and real. But like any other industry, not just yoga, but any industry, once it becomes enough of a commodity or a market, it becomes so diluted where we, you kind of lose what the essence of who you are in order to actually have a lifestyle so it seems to me i could be mistaken with what you're doing now and what you've been able to do you haven't had to sacrifice those things about yourself it i mean have you had to bump into like you can only do this and you can only do that and don't do these things when you're recording and like what kind of guidelines or is there any tape that's been put up for you or have you truly felt like no this is my thing and they let me do me Mm. well yeah um I love this I love this question hero um I mean it's cert- like my self-discovery journey has is ongoing right yeah. like it certainly hasn't been easy and like I think that like things like social media and like you know what we put out there might represent really just like kind of the happy highlights of our experience mm-hmm. whereas you know like the past few years have been a deep soul searching time for me and, you know, it hasn't been um, an easy journey and I know that it it isn't for anyone, but um, I mean, to a certain degree when I was teaching yoga at studios, and I know that you have both spoken about this previous, so I'm glad we can relate on this and feel free to jump in whenever, but um, it didn't feel sustainable to me. You know, Mm -hmm. when I was teaching up to five classes a day and really at the mercy of studios and how they wanted to schedule me and running around town on my bike, just trying to like, you know, summon up the energy to make it through day to day. And so I, I did need to like break out of that eventually, but it came at a cost. Like I certainly became um, burnt out from teaching and there's a reason why I don't teach Um, yoga in a studio setting at this time not that it's even available but like you know um, I've found my own way that's that's a good way of putting it hero and it it hasn't like hasn't been easy it was you know it it was painful to um, have that experience of just getting so exhausted from trying to fit into a mold or like do what I thought I was supposed to do as a, as a yoga teacher and, you know, feeling called to heal and, and or be of service, but then also like having that come at a personal cost, you know? It's so uh, controversial. Well, it's kind of controversial, but it's contradictory. It's so contradictory. The whole, I feel like the whole yoga industry, like that's a, that's a pretty broad and big statement, but I feel like it really is very contradictory in Vancouver, specifically with studio, studio teachers and teaching studios, because exactly what you said, I mean, it's like you feel one way and you're told through all your lessons and all your learnings through yoga to live authentically, like to, you know, teach from the heart, from the soul, find your teaching voice, your own, whatever it is. But then, then you're contradictory. It's the, you're told the opposite. So, I mean, it's just like, not only is it exhausting to have to survive monetarily but it's exhausting in the in the freaking mind like it's just it's polar opposites I don't even know what the solution is to be honest but I I'm totally with you because that's pretty much why I don't really teach anymore either very often and 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 piggy piggybacking on that I mean there's a couple things to unpack there is that 
because again, you're talking about being a voice actress, being a, a voice of different things that are who you are, but through a, a lens or a muse, I like to say. And when you're a teacher and you say, find your teaching voice, that alone is already toxic language. You don't have a teaching voice. You have your voice and you are teaching people, but you're using your voice to teach. It's not a teaching voice. So I know what you're saying. And they do say that, find your teaching voice. There is no such thing as a teaching voice. When the people say they sound like a yoga teacher, they're just being an actress or an actor or an act T or an act X and fulfilling the role of being a yoga teacher, which is everywhere. And that's why I think it's not their fault. It's really not their fault. It's just, they don't know any better. So those people kind of pollute. I don't care about saying that they pollute these spaces and they d dissolve and make less space for people like ourselves that maybe didn't come from the background of being looking the part or moving in the part or having the stereotype of the part and people that are real people from real life situations that didn't have any of those um, maybe capabilities prior to learning how to learn them from scratch, those voices aren't being heard. And so not to get into anything else that that could be translated to, but amplifying the voices of people that actually have something to share that is not always heard translates to every industry and every walk of life and yoga teaching in or out of a studio setting, corporate, non-corporate, whatever it might be, people have to take a risk and take a chance to meet their brand messaging, but also amplify authenticity within the voice of their people to also fit their culture without telling them or changing them for who they're meant to be. And yeah. that is the death of our industry that is happening. And I hate saying it because I wish to be in it full time still. And yet here I am saying the opposite that might potentially not provide me an opportunity for just being real. Oh, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Jesus. Oh, that's a big sigh for me. Um, Ingrid, I don't know if you want to chime in there. I don't even. even yeah. Yeah, you know, the truth telling side of it is, um, it, it's, it's really so important. You know, I think that we bring our, our personal experiences to, to who we are, to who we, to how we show up in the world, to who we are as teachers. And, you know, one thing that I've recognized is that, um, when I step back from a situation that doesn't feel right, that feels toxic, that doesn't feel like a good fit anymore, then what I have recognized recently is that the universe will open doors for me, right? Like it just, it always happens when I'm aligned, when I'm taking care of myself, when I'm spiritually fit, then it almost it happens automatically if I'm living in my truth that like I can take that risk to step back or to like speak my truth and remove myself from certain situations. And if I'm in right action, then the doors will open, right? Mm -hmm. It's very, 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 very true. <laughs> so when, when did you kind of, when was it that you kind of stepped back from teaching more in studios? Was it before COVID times, I guess? Mm -hmm. So yeah, here's my like truth telling moment. So this is where I really appreciated it. Was it Donovan that was on the podcast? Yeah. Yeah. Such a sweetheart. Um, I listened to that episode last night while I was walking salsa and I was like, thank you. Someone talking about mental health and addictions in the realm of yoga. Right. And I think that's a conversation that is happening more now, but like, I will say when I was teaching yoga, like I was struggling mentally um, from the very start, you know, like I found yoga and needing it therapeutically myself. I was struggling with eating disorders yeah. and um, I appreciated the benefit that it allotted me so much that I wanted to share that benefit. And so I went into teaching, not being cured myself, you know, I was still struggling and, and to a degree, I felt like, um, there was persecution more so back then, like, you know, 10 plus years ago when it came to eating disorders, there was less understanding around it and like not a, a lot of compassion. So, you know, it, it was something that I struggled with ongoing as I was teaching. And then, so I kind of felt like I was living a double standard and that was hard for me because, you know, I, I wasn't 
totally well. And I was sharing a message of wellness. And I think that I was on my wellness journey, but then at a certain point, like, um, it came to, um, it came to a head and something, something needed to change. And so, yeah, I mean, um, I will credit yoga and, and, um, and movement and meditation as, as being helpful in my recovery. And then also it was kind of like whack-a-mole. So when my eating disorder symptoms improved, um, I found that, uh, my drinking really, um, was exacerbated or, you know, like I started to, to drink more and more and, uh, and it became out of control for me, you know, like I became a daily drinker and then I really felt like I was living a double standard and I was experiencing like health consequences because of my drinking. And I, I had to remove myself completely. And, um, it was a really, uh, it was in 2016, it was a really dark time for me. Um, and then in 2017, things kind of came to a head and, uh, and I got help. And so, um, yeah, so I am so grateful to be here today and be almost four years clean and sober next month in June. Wow. Congratulations, Ingrid. That's, that's huge. You bring up such key points, I think, that, you know, being in the wellness industry, there's such a fine line between thinking that we, I don't know if Hero's like, he's like, I know what you're going to say. Do you know me that well? <laughs> <I'm just> no. <laughs> Um, uh, that there's such a fine line of like, um, being your optimal, opt optimal self in order to teach because you're teaching wellness, but also needing it yourself. And then where is that? Like, I mean, cause you know, we, you always hear, for example, of, um, therapists or psychologists, or, I mean, there's a reason why we go into these types of professions because we do need it ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So where is that balance? Because I, I've similar, not, I don't have the same experience as you, Ingrid, but I, I similarly felt still feel even when I'm teaching a class in a way that I'm an imposter, because I still deal with sometimes debilitating health anxiety and a lot of generalized anxiety, depression, like those kinds of things that I'm still trying to figure the fuck out. So you kind of, it's, it's a very strange world to be in, you know? Um, I don't know if, if everyone will ever figure it out completely and be able to teach from such a pure, pure spot or place, but, um, and do we ever, you know, like, I don't know if we ever arrive. Like, I think, you know, I know very much it for myself that my healing journey is ongoing. And just because, you know, I haven't had a drink for four years doesn't mean that like I couldn't pick one up tomorrow, you know, like I'm ongoing doing the work yeah. to, um, to make sure that, you know, I'm taking care of myself. And that's where going back to what we were speaking about that, like, I really like getting sober has made me recognize that like I need to put myself first mm -hmm. and my wellness has to be the priority in my life or I lose everything. Yeah. That is huge advice. <laughs> what are your, and I don't know if you are, um, and I with COVID and stuff and it's a bit of a sticky situation, but what has it been like, even if you haven't, dated or pursue dating and just dating yourself versus other people, bringing other human beings into your personal life. Um, have you noticed any reflections, any takeaways, um, any, is there, what's it like coming into that situation with what you're living with, what you're overcoming? What's it like dating people or talking to people that maybe are not um, from a similar background? Do you, is, is that even a thing or do you notice anything that comes up for you? Oh, let's talk about dating. <laughs> I'm curious. I'm curious to hear that, to hear about that. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the past four years have really been, um, also like a journey in discovery in that realm as well. So, um, for the first year, uh, when I was newly sober, I didn't date at all. Um, and then coming back to dating, I'm, I'm figuring it out, you know, like, um, I, I dated people that drank casually, but then I found that like casual drinking is actually sometimes disguise, a disguise for a binge drinking, right? Yeah. That like people are like, oh, I'm a casual drinker, but then they just get wasted every once in a while and, you know, um, and behave in ways that they wouldn't usually. And then like weird stuff happens. So that happened in a relationship. Um, 
earlier in my recovery that it didn't work out. And then so more recently, I dated someone who was in recovery uh, or who was sober. And um, I thought that was the answer, you know, and that like dating another sober person was going to, you know, be, be the, be the problem solver there. And then what I've recognized too, is that like, not everyone who is sober is necessarily well either. Mm. Yes. You know, yes. and that's speaking for myself as well. Like my, I haven't arrived, you know, my journey is ongoing. And so, um, yeah, like a, another like heart opening moment. Um, I went through a devastating breakup in January okay. where of this year. Yeah. 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 I had been with someone that I thought was the one and I, you know, I thought that it was going to work out and, you know, the, the, the book title, um, by Pema Chodron comes to mind, uh, when things fall apart, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, it, as much as it was incredibly painful, this past while since that breakup happened has been this time of like the most incredible self-discovery and like finding the opportunity in that challenge and, um, and growing from it. And it's really transformed my whole life. Like, wow. uh, yeah, it's it, just from like being broken open in that way. Mm -hmm. It made it forced me to look at, okay, who am I? What do I value? What do I want? And what am I actually doing in the world? You know, yeah. throw COVID on top of that. Cause I feel like, I feel like every, <laughs> everyone's been like reevaluating everything. So I can't imagine, you know, how difficult that time would have been for you. So I'm happy to hear that you've spun it positively and that all those great things were happening or have been happening for you. So mm -hmm. do you, and actually, and also just throughout COVID, cause I know hero hero played the, has played the dating game throughout COVID and that I was have. fairly awkward to say the least. And, <laughs> but not anymore. Cause you found your, your one more. I found my one. And it's funny how you say it, how you say awkward considering like you're, you're putting the words out there without me saying them. And I'm just like, okay, sure. <laughs> that's a read yeah, yeah, but yeah. not intentionally <laughs> no I have been able to I kind of said to myself really early last March um and you know like honestly I don't in a, in a non-defensive egoistic way I don't care what people think about me I'm me I'm gonna do me if it's not harmful to people intentionally I'm gonna do me I'm not sorry about it so when COVID started, I was, of course, no one knew what the fuck was going on, but I kind of waited, I don't know, a few weeks, a month, not that long at all until I said, okay, you know what? I need to still engage with people. I still want to meet new people. And it's up to me to decide what I choose to do about that, you know? And again, so I finally went on a date with an individual and it seemed right. And then realized that they were quite um, possessive. Um, so I shot that in the bud and then I experimented. Then I met someone, dated them for maybe six weeks. And then it was a positive experience, but also quite debilitating. So that ended. And then eventually, as Rachel mentioned, I finally said, okay, fuck it. I'm just going to go on Plenty of Fish, <laughs> not do any other dating app. If I'm going to find someone on Plenty of Fish, that's probably going to be the most legitimate if it's not in real life. And so I just locked out and found someone's profile and one video chat turned into a first date and we've been dating each other and now living together, basically, um, you know, unofficially <laughs> living together for the last couple of months and yeah, kind of you hold it a little bit and it's, we've been very happy. So who says you can't find love in a pandemic? Uh, Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. He's well, on my social media a little bit. So you might've seen photos of him. I have. And I've actually, <laughs> not that I've been creeping you, but I have driven past you like downtown. Cause have you? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, nice. oh, my God, with him? <laughs> oh my God. Amazing. But it's kind of like in passing where you can't really speak out because you're going so fast. Right. Like Exactly. No I was driving and yeah. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, like, I see them. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, just the sweetest thing. And like, I, in that moment, I just felt like my heart was expanding. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, very thankful, very privileged um, of all the things that are happening when things, as you said, like one, the one thing, like a whack-a-mole, you know, my personal life is fantastic. And my professional life is a big, what the fuck, you know, <laughs> and I'm not afraid or ashamed to say it. that's the real truth. And Rachel knows all about that. I've broken down into tears. I've had nervous breakdowns over the last like couple of weeks 
other falling outs with other people in my life. And it's just been like, okay, as you just pointed out yourself, Ingrid, these things happen when you're ready, you know, right timing or spiritual fitness, these things that are lining up or reconfigurating. I mean, it's never ending. Our lives are always going to be like that. And so when you're talking about, you know, trans, um, transitioning from teaching yoga and choosing not to teach yoga, going into the film industry in terms of being a voice actress and then coming to performance artistry, if I can use that term appropriately, and going into self-expression. Like, what did that all come through? And I know you said you were adopted, you came from Saskatchewan. Do you have um, do you have a hindsight in terms of like, what were your earliest days like and how that brought you through childhood, through adolescence, even like elementary to high school to university, because you said you ended up in BC, but I'm curious to know a little bit more about taking it back to Saskatchewan. And what can you recall about that part of your life? Mm, yeah, I guess. Um, if you want, yeah, if you want to. Yes. Totally. Oh, yeah. No, uh, I, I appreciated, Rachel, what you said in like one episode that I heard you were like, I have nothing to hide. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I really appreciate that, um, that you offered that. Um, I guess like <clears throat> um, my creative journey, like, like I mentioned, started when I was really young and uh, as a dancer and, and then I was always interested in theater. And I think that it was just always an outlet for me that, um, you know, it, it hasn't been until recently, like I mentioned with the breakup and processing a lot that I recognized this um, emotional pain actually that I have been running from my whole life. Um, And, and so it's not that like, like the arts and movement and theater and acting were covering that up but like it was an outlet for me because I didn't know how to process it right and so I was like a you know like a a nerdy theater kid and growing up and like you know it it I yeah I mean the the emotional pain that I speak of it manifested in the form of my eating disorders at the age of 10 So I was actually really young when I was first hospitalized. I was 10 years old. I was still a child. My goodness. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think it has to do with, you know, in hindsight, the the adoption and feeling like I wasn't part of, like I didn't fit in in my family. Like I was an outsider in my own family, much as they're amazing. And I love them so much. Right. Mm -hmm. They're, they've always done their best. Um, And so, you know, when I, um, was well enough to do theater and dance, you know, it was just this, it it was like my life depended on it because uh, there was so much in me that needed that, needed that outlet, that storytelling, the relief that it brought me from my own, like, you know, unwell thinking. And it just, it was an outlet that I could channel my energy into. And so the benefit that I felt from it, um, you know, it, it brought me opportunities. Uh, I started working in film when I was 15. I did a theater troupe all the way through high school for eight seasons. Um, And then I was working on a TV show when I moved out to BC. And so it was filmed in Saskatchewan. I was flying back and forth to Saskatchewan to film it. Um, And, um, and yeah, that's sort of the origin of it. And then like, there comes a time too, where, like I mentioned recently, like, even in recovery, I think I was still running from that pain. Like there, it got to a point where I couldn't cover it up anymore with alcohol, with drugs, with eating disorders, with, you know, staying busy with relationships, with art projects, you know? And so, so and go can, ahead. I was going to ask just about that. You, you mentioned unwell thinking and pain. Mm-hmm. Now, so when you say running from the pain, do you mean, I, I'm assuming it's not physical pain, you're talking about the pain, the emotional pain and the and the, the thoughts, and then just busying yourself with everything under the sun so you wouldn't have to deal with it, I guess, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and it was at the end of my relationship in January when I recognized, like, not only had I been using relationship, you know, like I had, you know, gone just kind of from one to the next. Hmm. But I had um, done everything in my power to cover up something that now was at the surface. Mm -hmm. And it, and, you know, heartbreak, it it can be such an opportunity to um, look at yourself in that challenge. And there was just a moment when I sat with myself 
and uh, it makes me emotional even just just thinking of it where once I finally sat and was still and I stopped running, the pain was transformed. Wow. Um, you know? Yeah. 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 into understanding like yeah. into an understanding that I don't need to run anymore yeah. oh you you have hit a, a bit of a nerve in me I think and hopefully for other people that are listening because even you know what I was mentioning before about health anxiety and always I I feel like I feel like most of us like that's incredibly brave and poignant because I I would s- wager to guess or say that most people are running from something and it it's the hardest thing in the entire world to sit with you like that is not only hard but brave and challenging and and brave i'm just gonna say brave again because it it is yeah yeah thank you and like what i'll say is that um it has clarified it has been like that challenge and that pressure and sitting with it has like pressurized to create like, you know, diamond clarity in me. And it's given me like um, a kind of vision for myself that I, it's just clarified my vision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like, I've recognized in my cover, in my recovery that I want, I've always wanted to be of service to others, like I think it's just been covered up by so much and obscured and confused in these various situations, right? Um, yeah. As it can be. And so, what happened uh, in that moment when I realized that I didn't need to run anymore is that, like, how can I be of service to the greatest degree? Mm-hmm. And and how can I live on purpose? And maybe it doesn't look like how I'm living right now. Um, So what needs to adjust in order for that to happen? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so then, and so what did you do? (laughs) Right? (laughs) So (laughs) excited for you. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think like there's already ways that I was of service. So even just this morning, I volunteer every week on a crisis line. Um, Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, so I'm able to work remotely. Currently I'm able to answer phones for this crisis line, um, from home and yeah. Um, and it was when I was actually a speaker at a women's recovery house, a women's drug and alcohol, uh, addictions recovery house that this woman, um, spoke to me and she asked, like she had relapsed many times and she asked, you know, I'm having, trouble recognizing um you know my higher power and yeah. if recovery is even possible for me and here i'm going to get emotional again because i do every time i tell this story i've given the disclaimer but the this woman was so bright she was so bright and shiny and beautiful and i i said to her in, in the moment i was like you know that like the universe is working through you right like you're so bright right like you have it in you already, even if you can't see it. And it was that moment that actually made me recognize that like, I have a potential in me to be of service to a greater, greater degree than, or in a different capacity than I currently am. And so like, as much as I love voice acting, I love teaching voiceover. uh, It's such a rewarding experience. I'm also um, on a path to pursue, and here's where I'm like, I don't want to speak too soon because it's still very much in process, Um, but I'm currently taking courses towards a master's in counseling psychology. Awesome. Good for you. Yeah. And as I speak that, like, it just feels so right. Yeah. That's amazing. Do you feel like you that there was, I shouldn't say there was no way, but maybe I'll just say this. You feel like there was no way that you could get to where you are and have this clarity without figuring your own shit out first. I feel like that's probably the the answer is yes. I'm assuming, but you know, it's just, again, like for example, like I struggle with the fact that I feel like I'll never really get my shit together to the, to the, to the extent where I can be 100% in service or for people like I don't know I just sound sounds so like I'm just shitting on myself right now (laughs) 
but you're inspiring. You're inspiring me. So I guess I'm just asking for some more advice, really. (laughs) Well, girl, like when it comes to what you're talking about, like I still have all of those stories, right? Like, and here you mentioned breakdowns. Like, yes, like my courses are entirely online. (laughs) You should have seen me yesterday. It was like breakdown after breakdown as I tried to figure out learning in these online spaces and the various platforms that post-secondary learning is happening within right now. Like, oh my gosh, like um, I needed to like download this app to record a video message. It seems straightforward, but it couldn't be downloaded on my Safari browser. And so I had to do like IT consulting and start a like help thread in the class discussion. Like it, I don't know. Like, I think that like this, this time frame of kind of living online, it certainly can make us vulnerable to feeling, I feel stress in a different way, you know, like it's like, it's this, pressure in a different way and like all of those stories still exist in me of like I'm not doing I'm you know I'm not fit enough or like you know whatever whatever stories uh have existed they still do and it's like I just turn the volume down on them Hmm. or I have all these tools right to like take a break go for a walk you know with my dog or like meditate you know like right before this conversation I did a little meditation doesn't need to be big things but like I just um I have that voice too and I have to recognize it and call it out for what it is and like yeah I mean in terms of going through my shit like Mm. you know my darkest hour in in struggling with with problematic drinking and substance use is now like the key that unlocks my universe right right yeah I love that I was and I was actually I was looking at my text message for a second because what my husband said to me not that long ago I was having really it was last week I was having a really shit day and I just didn't want to bring him down so I left the I like just left the house for like hours I was just gone you know, doing my own thing. And I was on my own. And then he asked if I wanted, if I wanted company, I just said, you know, not really. And the, and what he said to me was, I think just something that we all need to say to ourselves daily is be kind to yourself. He just basically, he just said the only words were, okay. I'm just reading it verbatim. Okay. Be cool. Be nice to yourself. Mm. Like so simple, Mm -hmm. so simple. And I know it's way easier said than done, but I think that those, the reminder, yes, especially during these times, you know, be kind to one another, obviously, but be kind to yourself, you know, be easy on yourself. Like, oh my goodness. Right. And like in the moment, it's not always easy, right? When, when you're in those moments of like tension and anxiety, it's like, how can I, you know, how can I be kind to myself right now? Like I'm in my, like, I suck thinking, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like, yeah, those, the, just remembering that I need to breathe and like taking a break, taking a break from myself, from my thinking. And, you know, that, that Mm. message your husband sent is so true. And I don't always want to hear it when someone says like, be gentle with yourself, but what does that actually look like? You know, Mm -hmm. like, Uh, yeah, for me, it's like getting outside and like, enjoying like little flowers like the lilacs that are in bloom right now and just like little things the little things really are like those simple things the simple joys in life it, that really is it's so valuable yeah it's true though I mean even for me the fact that I'm, I'm like so non-corporate and that here I am like endorsing Starbucks every day with my latte in my hand but I'm so content with the fact that I can get out and I have a purpose like I'm gonna get my latte I'm gonna go for a three-hour walk like whatever we need to do, the point is there's nothing wrong with whatever we need to do to get motivation. And as long as it's not harming us in the sense of like really, really harming us, I mean, then that's what we do to motivate. See a friend at a distance or in person to go see a family member if it's safe to do so at a time like right now. Go watch a movie from home or take your um, device with you and take it into nature and then watch something in nature. Like whatever you need to do, you need to do. Like for me, this has been a lifesaver for me. I haven't gamed since I was like a teenager. You know how many hours I spend on this when I don't have to be responsible? A lot. Whatever you need to do to be happy, just fucking do it because who's stopping you other than yourself? No, and I I also think we're living in a time right now that because we're being, because of the pandemic, we're pretty much being forced to spend even that much more time with ourselves. Like the amount of people that I've talked to that have just been like, I'm 
I've said about themselves and myself included, like, I'm just fucking bored of myself. I'm sick of, of just being with me or just with that one other person, whatever it might be. So yes, like, you know, getting out of our own way, being kind to ourselves, getting outside, doing those things. It's, it's, and also just recognizing it's going to be more challenging now. Yeah. It is. It is. And, you know, Ingrid, you're talking about do things that are self-caring or like we heal or we care from the things that we do at the same time. And, you know, the podcast, you know, for me and Rachel has been a place of, yes, there is work that is involved with it. And sure, Rachel does do a lot of work on the post-production side, which is fantastic. Thing. No, because it's the truth. We keep it real. But, you know, in terms of like, I do a lot more of the outreach and communications and networking things and securing, I kind of have self-proclaimed myself like the, ta- the booking and talent manager, so to speak, or outreach coordinator. Rachel is the operations manager. Like that, that is exactly what she does. And it's a healing for me, at least, to know that it, at least every week, I know I'm going to be able to talk to my best friend, if not every day. And I'm going to be able to talk to other really good friends of mine or people that I would like to be friends with <laughs> that have something to share. And it gives you that purpose and structure. So if it means you're going to go to counseling and go into doing classes to be eligible to do those things, if it means Rachel is going to go out on a walk and say, be nice to yourself from her husband, giving her that reminder, who cares what the fuck? it is just have an outlet whatever that outlet might be and it can change whenever you want it to change totally and I think that like you know just the the way that you are both facilitating that through this and through like the sharing of stories you know like I was listening to is it Ash Dr. Ashley McInnes yeah last night and like just awesome sorry (laughs) What she had to say, like, also was choking me up because I was like, thank you. You know, like, I think when one person can be themselves and share their story, it gives us all permission, right, to to be authentic in whatever way, you know, Mm -hmm. that that is true for us. And it it might not look what other like what other people want us to do or what they expect. And like, it really has to be authentic for you. And especially in this time, like. I just know that like, I, you know, from based on what I've shared, I can't, I can't fake it with myself, you know, like I can't run from myself wherever I go, there I am. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, if, and with your, so, okay. So I just, I always just look at the time and I can't believe we could talk for hours and hours on what time it already is. So currently you said you are, um, you're helping, actually, I want to talk to you about the, the helpline that you're volunteering for because that's something that I was actually thinking about as well um so you're doing that you've got your classes that you're currently teaching and are you still doing some talks um in recovery centers or was that just one that you did recently right so um I do periodically um get asked to speak in these settings it's not like on a consistent basis but um I mean because you know I am part of a fellowship uh, in recovery that has offered me so much. It's really the least that I can do to give back when I'm asked. So yeah, the, the crisis line that I work on um, is, is part of that fellowship. Although there are many and Rachel, I feel like you'd be such a good candidate. So I've actually looked into BC's um, helplines and there are several. Um, so there's one for youth and one for, for the elderly. And then there's one that's like a 24 hour line. And so there's, they're, they're based in BC and um for volunteers like myself um, in these sort of crisis line uh, answer, answering the phone positions, um, it's usually a, a weekend or a few weekends training that happens. And then um, usually they'll set you up uh, during this time remotely to be answering these calls. And then based on each individual call, it's, you know, taking it from there. And okay. it really gives me so much, you know, like it, it sounds selfish and um, in a way, but like when I'm able to be, be of service, it is deeply fulfilling. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think, I think that more than ever, I feel like maybe they, they need more volunteers than they ever have before. Maybe I'm wrong, but just with, with, the scope of what's happening with the pandemic and people, a lot more people maybe being in crisis. So with that being said, is there, you know, advice or first steps you can tell people that are, you know, going through maybe addictions currently, maybe it's gotten worse for them because of the pandemic. Is there any kind of anything, not even just advice, but 
I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to put that. Advice, advice just sounds, I don't know. I don't, I don't like that word. <laughs> maybe, maybe any considerations. Considerations, Yeah. Like anything they might do to help themselves. Yeah. I mean, like what I can speak to from my own experience is that if you're struggling with problematic substance use, you know, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest, that was the feeling that I had the most when I was in my deepest realm of struggle is that I felt that no one felt as lonely as I did. No one understood. No one had done the things I had done. No one lived in that like dark place that I was of just like, just, yeah, just loneliness, anxiety, depression, um, confusion, because like, I didn't even really know how to label it. Right. And so um, it wasn't until I had um, a sober person that manifested in my life um, that talked about being sober and how it was such a great life. And like, at the time I didn't even understand how that was possible. I was like, wait, what you live without alcohol and drugs. Like I didn't, I actually didn't understand how that was possible. And so um, they kind of planted it in my ear that it was possible. And so um, when I hit my bottom, I was able to recognize that actually help and resources are out there and I was able to access them. And so there are many, there are many resources and you don't have to be alone in struggle when it comes to, when it comes to addictions. And so I mean, the fellowship that I'm a part of is an anonymous one. And that like kind of almost uh, gives it away in and of itself. But just to put it out there, it's, you know, I had this idea about these fellowships, these 12 step fellowships, how they're portrayed in the media, that it was, you know, maybe a bunch of people that are just that I wouldn't be able to relate with that were like deeply troubled. And I didn't think that I was that troubled, although I was that troubled. Um, and, you know, I had this misconception that people that are at rock bottom are living, you know, without stable housing, that they're drinking out of like a paper bag, you know, that they're, they're on the street and that they're, you know, um, living in, in absolute, uh, you know, desolation. And, that's not actually the case. You know, addiction affects people from all walks of life mm -hmm. and addiction doesn't discriminate. And so when I came into recovery, I was amazed that there was such a cross section of every walk of life. All ages are represented, you know, like, so I have friends in recovery that are like, you know, still in their teens and in their twenties. And then, you know, people like me, they're in their thirties, all the way up to people that are in their nineties that maybe have like 40, 50 years of sobriety. Wow. Amazing. And it's possible. Yes. I love that. Well, and we'll make sure to put some, um, some outreach or out outlets in the show notes so that people can access those for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest thing that I would say is that like, you don't have to be alone. Recovery is possible. Like if myself as someone who was previously a daily drinker, like if I'm able to do it, you know, literally anyone can do it. And I've seen people also those people that, that once lived without stable housing, people that have lived on the street, I have also seen them go through recovery or I've seen, you know, the lawyer or the real estate agent that was living the lavish life, but also, you know, completely out of control. I've seen just all walks mm. of life go through recovery and I know that it's possible and there's no right way of doing it. So like I didn't go to a treatment center um, but that is one option, right? So there's many avenues, like there's not a right way, but ultimately it boils down to like, do you want it? Do you want, um, are you will, are you willing, you know, like it, it doesn't have to be, do you want to be sober forever? Because I only ever stay sober one day at a time. Yes. Mm. Yeah. You know, like I'm only as ever as sober as, when I wake up in the morning and go to bed at night sober, right? Like, and then uh -huh. I get a few days back to back. Right. That's yeah. very helpful though, right? It keeps you measurable and keeps you accountable because you're focusing on what you have control over, which is right now. Right? Like, can I stay sober in this hour? It, can I stay sober until I go to bed at night, you know? And over time it's become less of a struggle and like the obsession and desire to drink and use has been completely lifted. And, you know, that's by the grace of, God or a higher power or the universe. Right. 
And so, you know, all that's all that is required from someone who's struggling is a little bit of willingness, like a seed of willingness. Mm -hmm. Very well said. Um, is there, I mean, again, taking it from this kind of tone and taking it from this, I just want to commend you for your bravery, your courage, your, um, your comfort and sharing and being so raw with me and with Rachel um, and that we can facilitate that because regardless of a guest knows us from before or not, they could be a stranger, they could be existing. That doesn't equal what might come out on a discussion that is shared in such an intimate manner. So thank you for that. I want to really commend you for that because that's such a powerful tool that people can tune into and utilize your experience and resources for in the time to come um, as our platform reaches more people over time. So I want to acknowledge that. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> Secondly, um, one of the fun things we like to ask, which you might know because you've listened to our podcast, is if you were a kind of juice, what kind of juice would you be and why? <laughs> I love this so much. I mean, oh. so I think that I would be like, you know, they say they are, you are what you eat. So yes. uh, I'm obsessed with these health shots uh, for my voice. When my voice is raw, I drink these um it's like a ginger turmeric grapefruit orange black pepper cayenne pepper tonic and it yes. burns on the way down but you can feel it like yes you can love those but i've never heard it with the grapefruit i've had it with like all the other ingredients but the grapefruit and orange juice no maybe orange juice but anyway oh my god so good amazing it and packs a powerful these, punch do you make these yourself or do you get them from somewhere I have made them myself, but working with turmeric, I find just like it gets everywhere. Yeah. And I love like, <laughs> obviously the, you know, superfood benefit that yes. comes from turmeric and I, and I do work with it, but I also get um, these health shots from glory juice. So, and I'm nice. obsessed, like I, I get them all the time. And so I feel like Amazing. I would be that spicy juice if I, if I was to choose. Love it. I <laughs> love it. Juice. Glory juice is my fave because I lived like in the lower Lawnsdale area. I don't think it's even in lower Lawnsdale anymore. They might have. It is it. unless they closed it, but I think it might still be there anyway. But that was like, oh my God, but that was my go-to and their, um, oh, it's like an almond milk magic, not magic milk. It's like a mm. golden turmeric thing. That's like a, but it's like with a nut milk and oh my God. So good. So good. I miss those. So good. Delicious. Yes. Yes. Cause you're up by Vernon, right? I'm I'm in Vernon. Yes. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I love it here. And I've, it's not, podcast not about me right now, but I would not move back to Vancouver. <laughs> Honestly, like when I heard that you were up there, I was like, oh, you know, I hear, I, I love Vancouver and the opportunities that I'm pursuing right now are here. However, every day when I, I hear the sirens in the city, I'm like, you know, uh, and I'm walking or driving and it's traffic and I get like a gust of like pollution in my face. I'm like, what would it be like, you know? To <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. The opportunities. Like I, I didn't have a job that I had to stay in the city. So I get it. Like if I, if I did, I, I would, I would, I would stay down there, but just like different, um, we wanted different things, you know, we wanted a house. So we bought this like over hundred year old, old freaking house that needs a shit ton of work but you know we're young enough that it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't bother us that much that's another story for another day um because <laughs> yeah, and I've said this on a few few podcast episodes already but my my office is still being worked on I don't know if my husband's there but anyway <laughs> oh girl we always got those home improvements like I've got like don't even look behind my couch right now <laughs> <laughs> Well, one thing I do want to leave with is that I remember, I think the very first time that I met you was when I came in, I was probably in my first couple months of taking public classes and I came into a yin class of yours and it took me somewhere that was so magical. And I knew that when I had saw you, you had your blonde pixie cut and you were super fresh and bubbly and live. And I just thought... I wonder what the story is behind this individual. And I don't know when the turning point might have been when me and you begin to connect and so forth. And it might have been when I started being at the front desk, I would guess, because then you see more people and interact more frequently because there's a bit more time to connect and then 
course, when I began to teach myself. But what I'm getting at is that whatever you must have been feeling in those earlier days when I first met you, I can only imagine the lessons that must have been taken from those experiences and how they've shown up for you now. And to see what you're doing from those experiences back then, which was 10 or 11 years ago, again, give yourself credit for what you've accomplished and how those experiences potentially help shape you to become the ever going, ever ongoing um, evolution that is, that is Ingrid, you know? I could not, I'm going to chime in there for a second because I, I also think I met, I don't know how long ago that was, but it was Ryan Lear's one of the, uh, yeah. um, One yoga youth. Vinyasa yoga for youth. For, yeah and I was that a oh my god like that was a long time ago maybe it was seven years ago when I met you but 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 like what Hira said like back then you you leave such a lasting beautiful impression on, on people like you had so much light you were so vivacious and and bright and and again and you were going through so much shit back then so I can't imagine now like I can feel it just coming through the screen your your light is just enormous it's just beautiful and glowing so I'm just so happy to see that you've you know you're you're on your way kid I just kid I just yeah. call- <laughs> Hold on. I'm like that much older than you <laughs> I don't I don't know girl but like I remember you from that training and thank you thank you both for your kind words Rachel I remember this you know I think this is an example of like when we're stronger than we know we are you were brought to the front of the class and you did this handstand I have, you know what we could talk about, I don't know if I, <laughs> you, you continue. Cause my version of the story is probably going to be different than yours. <laughs> you know, it felt, <sighs> I, and here's where I don't know what your perspective is. And it felt like it was a little bit, the hand, the teacher was a bit disciplinary with you. Yeah. And it, yeah. And it felt like a bit too much. And at the same time, I saw you in that moment rise to the challenge. Yes. That's, that's a good take on that. It didn't feel, it looked like an uncomfortable moment. And, uh, and so I want, like, I want to acknowledge that. And then like, also like looking back at it, it's like, yeah, like you were able to do it under that pressure, you know? One, you, I couldn't have said it better myself in those short words without getting into too much detail. No, Absolutely. And thank you. And thank you for, I like, cause you said, when I won't say the teacher, we kind of already said the name, but that's okay. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. You know, and like, we, like I can, I could look back at my experience and, and really pinpoint like, you know, whatever certain times and places and people, but ultimately the journey has been about myself, right. And, and, and self-discovery and, You know, I think that to anyone who has experienced struggle and challenge in various ways, like those opportunities are actually, those challenges are beautiful opportunities for growth for everyone. Yeah. And I, and I do actually look at it in that way. I do. It's just, you know, uh, yeah. Do I, do I agree with exactly how it went about? Maybe no. But I, but I do take it as a huge learning experience. And yes, I do take it as, you know, part of my resilience and, and being able to stand up uh, in front of those types of challenges. So yes, <laughs> I'm having a hard time, like not wanting to explain more. <laughs> Cut it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I feel you. And, and, and hero as well. Like, I feel like you know, you have been such an example of just someone who is blossoming to me, you know, and it looks different for everyone. And I, uh, I'm so honored to like, yeah, to have shared this time with you. And I really do hope that we can connect and go for a walk. I would love you that. Will. I was going to say it's time. Okay. <laughs> it's going to yeah. happen very soon. Rachel, I wish you could join us. <laughs> I know. I know. One day she will. One day I will. And I know we're, we're so close to just knock on wood, some restrictions opening up and those kinds of things. And, you know, head back down to Vancouver because I, there's a lot of people, I mean, my mom, I briefly saw in February, which was nice. But since then, my sister hasn't seen my mom. My sister lives up here. Hasn't seen my mother in like six months. She, my sister has a a little one, like a two-year-old. So the grandkid, my grandma, Nana hasn't seen her grandchild in like six months. So it's, 
but it's happening. Mm-hmm. It's going to happen very soon. Well, and also, I mean, when was it that you, you came to visit me and you surprised me at work? Was that in February? Was that the same visit? Yeah, February. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. And it's May now. So there you go. When she came down and she surprised me, I swear. I don't know if you saw that video. I think it's still on our podcast channel. It is lit. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it's ridiculous. The high (laughs) octave. (laughs) Oh, I, but that gay gas was just like done. I was like, come on in. It's like, it's your oyster. What do you want? (laughs) I love it because you look at me and it's like, because we're both wearing the masks, obviously. And you looked at me like, I don't know how many times. And then five, five times. And then finally, and I'm videotaping the whole thing. And finally, like, you're like, and very, fairly polite, but very stern. Do I know you? Do I know you? And it was so funny. And then the, the light in your eyes of just that recognition was just, <laughs> light bulb went on and then just <laughs> shot over to me. And like, anyway, it was good. It was funny because I was helping, I was actually helping a family of four people. I was helping the, the father and the family of four. And then, I'd, and they were really chill. Like they were the perfect like Sunday retail couple, like family you would want to have for an hour in the store. So when I saw Rage and I was like, sorry, my best friend just came in from Vernon. I can't believe she just arrived. Like, oh my God, I don't care. Go, go. They were like, uh, I'm like, guys, take over, take this over. <laughs> it was just like, boom. Yeah, so pretty amazing. She, she was texting me the day, like half an hour before as if she was at, in Vernon. So it was even more susp- surprising to be like, oh my God, like, you planned this. Like, like you're, you're right here. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So, yeah. It was brief, but it was worth it. So Oh, so brief. Oh, I remember the days when I used to wear briefs. And then I, my thighs were <laughs> eating. <laughs> oh so disappointing. Oh, Ingrid. All right. Thank you for your time so, 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 so much. And it's great to see, sorry, one more thing, because we've had Tim on the show. Yes. And you guys are, like, you guys are really good friends. Tim is just my love. Yeah, I adore them so much. And, uh, you know, was a sober person before I ever got sober. And so um, I really, uh, I really appreciate um, the friendship based on yoga and recovery and just, you know, all all of the things that 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 um, that Tim and I share. And, you know, when I am so inspired by, by your connection, you two as well. And I think that like, just wrapping up that this, this time, like, it really highlights how important our, our connection is. And, you know, you talk about, you know, loving humans on this show. And I think that like, we can all take from this time that, you know, we are here to lift each other up and support one another. And, and thank you for both doing that in your own way through this podcast. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for everything you just, you've brought to us as well. You brought to me in my life and will continue to bring to me in my life as we continue to rekindle our in-person connections uh, very soon. And Rachel will take care of all the post-production and have your recording up within the next week or so. Um, And we can share that with your communities and anyone that it may be able to reach. And who knows? Uh, what will happen but we're so happy that we could have this time together right now together and it's made my day very much (laughs) me too i hope and i can't wait to see you in person one day we will so keep in touch and all the best to you thank you thank you thank you so much (laughs) sending hugs (laughs) lots of hugs lots of hugs that's (laughs) exactly (laughs) I know, right? I'm having a hot flash. Oh, I said it. (laughs) Yes, you are. (laughs) Okay, Ingrid, take care. Lots of love. Bye. 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 Bye.